Welcome to another edition of Anglican Unscripted, episode 687, the Friday edition. I'm Kevin Coulson. I'm George Conger. It's September 17th, 2021. All right, welcome to another episode of Anglican Unscripted. We're glad you're here watching or listening to us on podcast form. Uh, To set you up, if you're new to the program, this is how it works. Whenever you see our faces, you click like. Oh, it's a new Unscripted. You you go to Facebook, you click the like button. You go to YouTube, click the like button. And that gives us free advertising. Likes are free is what we say in the industry. Like I'm in the industry, right? And please go to the comment section on YouTube and add your comments to the show. There's lots to talk about, like there was last week with the uh, death of Bishop Spong. And there will be this week with the the GAFCON meeting and the follow-up to the... uh, consecration of a woman to the episcopacy in kenya lots have happened this week and we get to talk about it also if you've not shared this program with your friends family or foe now's your chance you click that little uh, url at the top you click share you copy paste send it all around to all the people you think need to watch kevin and george talk about all things anglican george how you been doing this week i'm just great kevin getting ready for the fall, lots of busy time, lots of pastoral work. Um, life of a parish priest, it's fun, it's wonderful, it's never boring. Mm-hmm. We are decamping ourselves here in Madison today, and we're going to head over to Milwaukee for a day or two, and then we're going south, George. We're, we're leaving the, the great tundra here in the north, and I think we're going to hit Kentucky and some other places and slowly make our ways down to Florida. Where it, Has the weather gotten better down there yet? When we left, it was atrocious. Well, the weather is perfect in Florida. It is always sunny, always dry, mild breezes from the ocean. You all want to move here, folks. Uh, Humidity's been a little high, Mm -hmm. and that's getting much better. Um, So, Kevin, welcome on. Come on down. Yeah, I think Florida is perfect November to March. Uh, it's mm. 70 to 80s, a little breeze off the west coast there. Uh, rain here or there, but you don't have the 3 p.m. rain showers every day during the fall. So we do like that very much. Uh, okay, so uh, I, somehow we're going to incorporate a death into the good news story. Um, George and I are longtime fans of uh, Saturday Night Live. Uh, I watched it in the 70s when it was good. George continued on through the 80s and uh, well into the 90s because he had nothing to do at 10 o'clock. I was long asleep by then. So uh, let's talk a little bit about uh, Norm MacDonald, who recently passed away, a great comedian. uh, And we found out recently that he's he's been a Christian. Uh, In fact, small world my son went to the same school that norm mcdonald did uh it was uh, saint joseph's in trumbull uh, a private uh roman catholic school there and uh so i thought we could talk about him you loved him from saturday night live tell us about him george well saturday night live was the first really show that i would grown-up show i would watch by myself my parents would go to bed and in middle school I would stay up late on Saturday nights and and I always enjoyed weekend update I, mm. as a 10 11 12 year old I really didn't understand many of the other jokes but I can remember going to school on a Monday morning and with my friends uh, whispering to each other Francisco Franco was still dead um, that was the breaking news that was. Um, so maybe Kevin you and I should start saying Jack Spong is still dead uh, as our sign online. Yes. <laughs> and I became acquainted with Norm. It, the show would go in and out, in and out of... Uh, it declined, in my view, after the first few years. And I've watched less and less, and I can't say I've watched it at all in the past 10, 20 years. But I did watch Norm MacDonald in the 90s when he did the weekend news update. Uh, he and Dennis Miller, I think, were the last two people I really enjoyed watching on that show. And they both had that slot, the weekend news anchor. Mm -hmm. And Norm MacDonald had a very dry wit, a very cutting wit, very funny fellow, and always enjoyed watching him. And he wasn't afraid to take on anybody. 
And I later learned that he was fired because of his O.J. Simpson jokes. He did the best O.J. Simpson news update. Yes, he did. <laughs> and and the uh, at the time, the president of NBC was a close friend of O.J. Simpson. And so the president of NBC said, cut out the jokes. And Norm said, no. Nope, and Norm got fired. Well, he's passed away from cancer at the age of uh, 61. He's mm-hmm. relatively young. And I had not known he was ill. And he's been on TV on late night shows, and I really don't watch those anymore. But I have seen him on YouTube, and I've come to know, learn that he has become a believing Christian. He, was, he went to Catholic schools in Connecticut. He was always a cultural Christian. Mm-hmm. But something changed in his adult life where he came to understand that Christ was his Savior and died for him so that he might have life eternal. And so that when Norm MacDonald died, it's a tragedy on many levels. Uh, It's a shame, but it's not a tragedy Mm -hmm. because he's gone to his maker and he is in heaven with our Lord and Savior right now. When you think of who his peers are and the the Hollywood ethos, uh, to have a person uh, working in that environment come to faith and maintain it uh, onto their death is amazing. It's, It's wonderful to hear. I'm going to post a link to what I think is Norm MacDonald's funniest joke in the show notes if you want to go check that out. If you agree with me, put it in the comments. Or if you have a better Norm MacDonald joke you want to post to the comments, I will be sure to approve it so it gets through. So, yep. It it is funny in that um, uh, if you think of the the people who have not ended well on Saturday Night Live, of course there's John Belushi. Sure. But the other fellow was Chris Farley who was also a very, very funny comedian. Mm -hmm. And I would think he, being a Wisconsin got boy, would... uh, Chicago. uh, No, he was from Milwaukee. (laughs) He he did. He was from Milwaukee. He went to UW, but uh, he uh, went to... Most of his studio work was in Chicago. He was a devout Christian, Mm -hmm. but he was a conflicted Christian, and that he would go on these binges of drinking and drugs, and and then he would go to confession. you know, he'd stay up all night drinking and shooting heroin, and then he'd go to confession at 6 a.m. at his Catholic church. And for Chris Farley, the shame of it was he knew the truth, but somehow his addictions prevented him from living them out. Norm MacDonald knew the truth, and even though he was suffering, he was given the strength and the ability to be faithful to the end. Mm. Okay, now you made me sad. (laughs) (laughs) <laughs> this good news stuff isn't working. All right, George, let's move on to a sadder story. Um, as we reported last week on our show, uh, the province of Kenya has consecrated its third woman to the episcopacy uh, in conflict with the ethos of GAFCON. And we're going to talk in general, George and I, about where GAFCON is now, uh, how it got here, and maybe the future for GAFCON, uh, because this doesn't just affect Kenya or Nigeria or the other uh, GAFCON provinces. It it affects the ACNA and GAFCON's future. Is this something that uh, has a long-term life uh, to it if it can't have internal accountability, which, you know, George and I have talked many times about accountability within the church, uh, at the diocesan level, at the church level, at the province level, And certainly at the leadership level, the Anglican Communion has faltered so badly over the last many years because there's been no accountability. Uh, The Episcopal Church is on, you know, on its deathbed because there's been no accountability uh, 40 years, 50 years going on, uh, 60 years. I'm just going to put it out there. 60 years. (laughs) Quick math in my head. And when there is no accountability and there's no uh, shared vision Uh, of some important things like what happens outside of your uh, membership things get tougher and right now many members of GAFCON are looking at the news that came out of the recent primates meeting of GAFCON and saying huh so we're not going to do anything about the women bishop issue it's just going to continue and George you and I are going to have to talk about that because this affects GAFCON 4 this affects you know the the trouble we've had with Nigeria here in America within the ACNA uh, jurisdictions. Um, this affects 
what happens if there's a female primate uh, in Kenya or Uganda in the next a dozen years or so? Would they be invited to a GAFCON? Um, this affects the topic of the universal bishop. And I think that's what we should talk first, George. What is a universal bishop? Well, do you want to start there? Or do you want to tell people what happened in Nairobi this week? I and don't then... want to tell. No, I don't want to. I want to, I want to hide that. Yeah, okay, let's tell them what happened. Well, the GAFCON primates met for the first time since 2019. Good news. Uh, some had to come via some had to come via Zoom mm -hmm. uh, because their particular countries are still under lockdown. But they gathered at All Saints Cathedral in Nairobi, and they had a full agenda. Uh, they talked about the Welsh problem. Uh, they had a uh, m message from Welsh Evangelical Fellowship of the Church in Wales mm -hmm. saying, help, what do we do? Our province has endorsed gay marriage, gay blessings. So the GAFCON primates are now moving their focus to Wales to help those people who may be read out of fellowship because they cannot follow their bishop's lead on gay marriage. And the bulk of the time was on, that's not fair, the intense, the bulk of the intensity was on the Kenyan consecration of Rosa Kano. And they agreed to disagree, where that we are not of one mind on this issue, but we're going to consider this at a aphora, a second order issue. And we look back to the original Jerusalem declaration and noted that there were issues that we all agreed on some of and then those issues that were of second lap order nature we're not going to worry ourselves about because we can still see each other the work of christ now let me just sort of take a sidestep out and then sidestep back in to help explain this for people pope francis was in slovakia this past week and on the flight home he uh, was asked by reporters francis loves to uh, walk into the press section of his plane and chat with the reporters and this always gives his handlers heart failure Francis was asked about the German call for same sex some German bishops want to have same-sex marriage and blessings and the European Parliament wants to make same-sex marriage universal for Europe Francis says I have sympathy for we almost we must show love and compassion for those with same-sex attractions but the church cannot change any of the seven sacraments because the, no church, no single church, has that authority to change the sacrament. Therefore, we cannot change the sacrament of marriage. So it's just impossible. We can have, you know, the church has no problem with civil partnerships to allow people to have property transfers free of tax and things like that. But when we talk about marriage and we talk about the church, the church, the universal church, cannot have same-sex marriages because that changes the basic fundamental sacrament. Step back into the Anglican world. The Anglican world uh, has two sacraments, the two major ones, communion and baptism, and then it has five minor ones, which include marriage and ordination. The Anglican world has been fine with changing the minor sacraments. I can remember Frank Griswold saying way back when, we can have gay bishops, we can have same-sex marriage, because this is adiaphora. It's a sec secondary issue. It's not one of the two major sacraments. We're not talking about the Trinity. We're not talking about baptism. We're not talking about Eucharist. We're talking about things that can be locally adapted. And that's why Gene Robinson was able to be consecrated because it was a second order issue that the United States felt was not a challenge to the Catholic faith. We fast forward now 20 odd years. Same argument. And the same argument. Mm -hmm. Ordination is a second order issue. Mm -hmm. Because we in Kenya believe that women are called to the ministry of bishop and this is not a first order issue. It is not a sacrament as Anglicans understand a sacrament. It's a minor sacrament. Therefore, we should be free to change it. So this is the arguments. Now, I'm not saying I agree or disagree, but the point, the problem I see from a bigger picture is the same argument that permitted the Episcopal Church 
and the Canadians and others to go ahead with gay marriage and gay clergy has been taken up by the Kenyans to say we can have women bishops. See, Frank Griswold, uh, would, I remember the primates meeting in 2003 in London, and Frank Griswold argued that, you know, the people of New Hampshire called this man, Gene Robinson, to be bishop. The Episcopal Church affirmed that, that he's a bishop. The Drexel Gomez got up, and this is the point that you started off with, Kevin. Drexel Gomez says, a bishop is a bishop of the Universal Church, and if yeah. the Universal Church cannot accept this man as a bishop, he's not a real bishop. And so the Gene Robinson, in Drexel Gomez's words, Drexel Gomez was one of the leaders of the Global South, pre-GAFCON, Archbishop of the West Indies. Drexel said that Gene Robinson, his ordination is valid but irregular because he cannot be received as a bishop across the Anglican world. Rose Okano's ordination has the same character as Gene Robinson's. It's a valid ordination, but it's irregular because that ordination cannot be accepted across the spectrum of the Anglican world. So that's the problem that we're facing right now with GAFCON is that they've taken on board, if you will, their opponents' arguments and allowed them to carry the day. Yeah, and I remember Catherine Jefford Shorey had the same uh, said about her as well, that she is presiding bishop, but is, it is irregular. Uh, and that was discussed at some of the primates' meetings. Um, yeah, I mean, the implications here, uh, as far as accountability and long-term goals of GAFCON, uh, can't be uh, overstated. Uh, I remember, you know, initially people asked me, well, what's GAFCON 4 going to be like? And I thought, you know, GAFCON 4, wherever they meet, will probably be a real reach to ecumenical uh, uh, partnerships, you know, reaching out to the Orthodox, reaching out to the Roman Catholics, reaching out to, you know, the more conservative denominations around the world, and, and maybe have, have, have them invited to GAFCON 4 and and do that principally maybe have another uh council of the church so to speak and i think when the world looks at what happened here with the gafcon primates not being able to come out of this meeting uh in an accountable fashion i think some of that future for gafcon has been tarnished george yeah uh at the in Nairobi this week, they announced GAFCON 4 would be in Kigali, Rwanda in 2023. Mm -hmm. um, will it come off? Well, they'll probably have a meeting. Yeah. But the question is, will it matter? Uh, will, it, uh, will it be just a rah-rah a cheer session? Will it be an actual gathering of the leaders of the church? We don't know. Because GAFCON for good or ill, has installed an update into its operating software. Yeah, absolutely. Um, I, I think we've hit a... It, they, they didn't, it's not an upgrade. I think they said, hey, why don't we try the beta? Let's, let's see if the beta is better than the operating system. And now we're doing a, a beta test, George. Well, actually, we're probably in the reboot, and yes. I'm watching the little <laughs> circle spinning on my computer of GAVCON. <sighs> because... GAFCON does have competition, which is the Global South uh, movement. Sure. Uh, Julius, uh, I forget his last name, the Bishop of Mombasa, was quoted by the Religion News Service, uh, asked about the moratorium. He said, yes, Kenya is still following the moratorium, but each diocese has the autonomy to decide these second order issues. So we hear GAFCON saying no, but we also hear GAFCON saying that some issues we can decide for ourselves, which doesn't really make logical sense, but hey, I'm not going to push that line. No, no. Um, but, and some one of the commenters on our, uh, whether it was on Anglican Inc.'s Facebook page or website, said, you know, he was a Kenyan clergyman, mm -hmm. and for the vast rank and file and probably a number of bishops of Kenya, GAFCON is just a name. 
Yeah. It has no sense of identity, certainly not among the lay people, hardly among the clergy, and maybe only among the senior bishops. It's a primate's assembly. And we follow GAFCON by, because we follow our primate, not because we have any ties to GAFCON. So the question is, is this rebooting of GAFCON into a fellowship of primates or is this is it going to be hung up in a perpetual loop and never get past the women's issue i don't know yeah i mean uh, and here's the, the the second part of this uganda has desired to do this you know they you know they have some candidates they've identified to be uh women bishops well what are we gonna why can't we do it Kenya did it, and uh, nobody they didn't get a slap on the wrist or anything. Uh, they just had a, a tense meeting among the primates. I think it's time now. You, we as Uganda also have women in the episcopacy, and then you know that there was a minor news story which I did, which was so minor I didn't even run it on Anglican Inc. Uh, but a uh, when in the Ugandan government cabinet, there is a representative from the Anglican Church. Uh, she's already a government cabinet minister, but this woman is also a, a member of the Anglican uh, community there. And the Archbishop of Uganda asked her to represent the church in the cabinet. So the Anglican church has no problem with women politicians, women prime ministers, women being representative to them for the government. And they've had women clergy for a very long time. So the opposition to women pre uh, bishops in Uganda is entirely out of restraint because our primate said so, mm -hmm. not because this is a theological conviction for us. And, you know, those can only hold so long. So we need to see which way will GAFCON go. And I hate to say this, but if you look at the financials, the money is not flowing into GAFCON. Uh, I'd hate to be the fundraiser for GAFCON right now because if I go to the dozen Americans who always can be counted on to put $100,000 into this conference or $10,000 into that project, these guys and gals have been tapped for 20 years now. And what new things are you going to tell? We've got the newest conference that will really make a difference. We've got the newest organization that will really make a difference. If you give us $100,000 to make this happen, you will see change. Been there, done that. Yeah, I mean, at a certain point, proclaiming that you're not, you know, the Anglican Communion, you're the ACC, or, you know, you're not Justin Welby or the Church of England, that only goes so far. And, you know, GAFCON's uh, 10 years old now. Uh, it's, for all intents and purposes, a mature organization, um, except for stuff like this. You know, somebody got their foot shut in the door. And there's a, there's a little pain going around, and how are we gonna how are we gonna make sure we don't get our foot shut in the door again? And we just last year and the year before have been dealing with Nigeria uh, and their relationship with the ACNA here in America. Uh, another kind of a black eye for Gafcon and the ACNA. You know, yeah, the the uh, art, the primate of Nigeria okay the the creation permanent creation of a nigerian jurisdiction in the united states now that goes against everything that was originally set up for these or alternative jurisdictions you mm -hmm. offered a safe harbor to people in another country until they got their act together then you withdrew and allowed that new national church the acna anic and so on and so forth to grow and prosper. So the West Africans, the Nigeria, uh, the Kenyans, the Ugandans, the South American church, and even and the Nigerian church, the Rwandan church, all turned over their jurisdictions. Nigeria held back the longest. And then when new leadership stepped in, it was able to tell the primate that the ACNA is not as pure as we would like it to be. And you, so you now see on the social media claims that the, the, new, the Nigerian uh, jurisdiction is the purest form of Anglicanism that is still connected to the Anglican communion. 
And what we're seeing is a replication of what happened at the Conference of St. Louis in the 70s when the continuing church movement began. And it began with one conference where everybody was together, then it split, then it split, then it split, then it split. ACNA has had the unique experience of having an entrepreneurial leader, Bob Duncan, who got the business going. <laughs> and he performed the impossible. He kept herded all the chickens all the cats, cats into the same direction <laughs> and then it made the best choice of its bob successor moving mm -hmm. from an entrepreneur to if i don't want to say manager but basically a businessman who can make the administrator institution, good, a good administrator, administrator yeah. make the institution mm -hmm. have that shift away from its founder to the next generation and with Foley Beach, the ACNA showed it was here to stay. Well, so the splitting. ACNA also had a, the benefit of having a great A string. You know, mm. they, they had all these great bishops lined up that uh, uh, were holding the line. Um, you know, with within the uh, defining documents of the ACNA, I know he's been breaking ranks uh, too terribly. Maybe one or two uh, here on social media and stuff, but you know. As a whole, the ACNA, their their A game is strong. Uh, but I don't, that is true, Kevin, but I still think we need to focus on the man, the Foley Beach. Oh, sure. Because there were, there were maybe two dozen other ACNA bishops who if they became primate, ACNA wouldn't be here anymore. Absolutely. I firmly believe that Foley Beach mm -hmm. kept the ACNA together. I firmly believe that the centrifugal forces that were tearing GAFCON apart would have torn ACNA apart were it not for the leadership of Foley Beach. I can't deny now you can that. say, well, Foley Beach is the chairman of GAFCON. Why can't he do that? Well, he doesn't have the, the authority. And he, he does. And so the A-team of GAFCON, when it started, mm -hmm. uh, Peter Akinola was a gift. Mm -hmm. I mean, the British press painted this guy as if he were a James Bond villain and he went along with it and he was a wonderful he was perfect he had such wonderful press with Peter Racanola and Henry Arambi. Arambi, the, yeah um, and you know Venables. Bob Duncan ca yeah. you know from the cast of Harry Potter <laughs> as one of the Hogwarts professor with his eyebrows and, a crafty and I, it was it just like and, all the the top people there yeah and it was wonderful because Rowan Williams of course looked like a, a wizard from uh, <laughs> Lord of the Rings <laughs> Lord of the Rings and now, um, the new GAFCON primates can't get past, as we see with Nigeria, their parochial concerns. Now, these are major parochial concerns. Yes, these are not, you know, silly issues. But the impetus that was there at the beginning is gone. And perhaps they're also helped by the fact that their opponent, Justin Welby, is so utterly helpless uh, and... Uh, it doesn't have the gravitas of Rowan Williams or uh, he, he doesn't present well on the TV or the radio and just you can't really get yourself worked up about him. I mean, he looks like the bank manager who turned down my application for a second. Denied. Mortgage. Um, Denied. <laughs> he, he, he's not somebody where you with where the eyebrows or the beard waggle at you and you're thinking, what uh, mystical things is he thinking? I'm being silly, but the man does make the movement many times. And we're now in a vacuum period. Um, and this is why when I say, this is why I'm arguing GAFCON is rebooting and I don't know what the final program's gonna look like. Mm -hmm. Perhaps this is why uh, Foley Beach is also invested in Apple technology uh, <laughs> while his Microsoft <laughs> machine is working because they've got the global south they on do. the sidelines they, ready to yeah. step in. And that may happen, you know. Uh, Global South has been there for a long time. Uh, they have good uh, connections with the Global Anglican Communion, uh, but they also have tech connections that they've kept up. And so you'd have to, you know, see how that works around. I don't know. I don't know, George. So I think we spent enough time talking about GAFCON. I want to see their reaction to our comments before we go any further. Um, but... Uh, uh, one of my difficulties with, you know, getting news out of Gafgan is we've been calling up 
some uh, of our old friends and asking for a comment, and they say we can't talk because we signed an NDA statement. Is that something we can say on the air? Sure, because okay. we did sign a net non disclosure agreement. <laughs> okay. So I'm like, you know, we can't really get, you know, the good internal stuff that we used to get because uh, um, there's non disclosure agreements being signed in, in a church organization. Mm-hmm. I can't tell you how that uh, makes me feel, George. So. Oh, yeah. my. So. All right, let's move on to some other news. We've certainly talked about GAFCON enough. The Diocese of the Middle Atlantic sent out a video and press release that Bishop John Guernsey is stepping down. Uh, He was one of the consecrations I filmed in Uganda uh, many years ago. It was the first six-hour consecration I've ever attended, George. And if I think of John Guernsey, I think of an A-team. He was one of these people who uh, was always a great bishop, uh, certainly a great pastoral bishop. And um, what are your memories of him? I met John in, uh, I think it was December of 96. Mm -hmm. John was a deputy from Virginia to the general convention that was going to meet that summer in Philadelphia. And John was one of the one of the on the ground team that was going to be part of this American Anglican Council, AAC team, that was going to basically run a political operation in Philadelphia. I was a recent seminary graduate. I had graduated that May of 96 and was a chaplain at Thomas Jefferson Hospital in Philadelphia. And I can remember having lunch with John, I think it was the Union League and somebody else, and then walking him around downtown Philadelphia and showing them the convention center and and I showed him, this is the old Federal Reserve Bank, and, you know, this would be great. It's right across the street. We can rent this for next to nothing. And and uh, so that was my experience, first meeting with John Guernsey, and I've known him ever since. And mm-hmm. he's a wonderful man, a kind man. He went on to become the first founding bishop of the Diocese of the Mid-Atlantic of the ACNA. And he really has been one of the heroes of the Anglican renewal in North America, in mm-hmm. my opinion. Oh, absolutely. Yeah. And, I th- and he will... It's not that he's dead, uh, but he will be missed. His influence and his counsels will be missed. I think. Absolutely. Yeah. So, good job, uh, Bishop Guernsey, and uh, uh, we, we do hope that we see you at all these functions as time goes on, maybe even a GAFCON 4. So, uh, I lost my notes page, George. Um, well, let's do, let's jump back into Nigeria. Quickly. Okay. Sure. Um, a few weeks ago, we reported how Emmanuel Chukwuma, the Archbishop of Enugu, which is in southeastern Nigeria, which is the old Biafra area populated by Igbo people, was threatened by, with death by separatists from the IPOP, indigenous people of Biafra movement, who were trying to resurrect the Biafran Republic, which was the source of a 67 to 1970 civil war where millions died. And on Mon- on late Monday night, an Anglican priest was murdered, uh, allegedly by terror- terrorists from the armed wing of IPOB. Um, IPOB has called for uh, Monday, wor- wor- Monday work stoppages across Biafra. Uh, until independence is granted, there will be no work performed on Monday. Well, this priest in his church allowed students to sit for their West African secondary school exams sort of the equivalent of SATs and whatnot. And because of that, terrorists allegedly linked to IPOP uh, went into it, murdered him in the night, burned his car, and sent a message that, you know, you don't violate the no work on Monday rule. Now, IPOP has released a statement uh, by the wonderfully named uh, Comrade Powerful, uh, its spokesman, that no, we didn't. We didn't kill him. We're for the people of Biafra, not against them. But it's pretty straightforward that he was killed for violating the IPOB's curfew orders. Mm-hmm. So when we talked about Nigeria being in the middle of a whirlwind of destruction, we have the separatist movements in the southeast killing Anglican clergy. We have Muslim Fulani tribesmen in the Middle Belt, in the north, killing Muslim clergy. We have Boko Haram going farther north, killing everybody. Um, 
If Nigeria holds together as a unitary federal republic, I will be surprised. Um, it's really bad situation there politically, and uh, the security situation is grim. Yeah, and really grim. we saw years ago Sudan split to North and South Sudan. Uh -huh. If this time next year there was a North and South, and probably East and West, uh, Nairobi, I'm not Nairobi, Nigeria, I would not be surprised. You know, um, yeah. The, the the problem I think would be though is that the army is led by northerners, Muslims, yeah. and all the oil wealth is in the southeast, the Ibo regions. Oh. So I don't the, I would not discount a genocide. Yeah. You know. And I, I hate and, to say that. But there's already one starting. Yeah. Uh it's always difficult because when we say genocide, we think of trains and Auschwitz and the Nazis Rwanda. being methodical. Yeah. And, but an African genocide is like Rwanda, where you basically go into a village and kill everybody. And we're seeing that. Uh, we reported on on Tuesday about a priest, uh, a minister, uh, murdered and on last Sunday, and 11 members of his congregation killed by M Fulani terrorists driving Toyota pickup trucks with submachine guns peppering the building with their gunfire. We're seeing that almost every weekend now. And we can say it's a genocide because it is one group targeting another. There's no Christian groups driving Toyota Hilux pickup trucks with submachine guns mounted on them shooting up madrasas. It's all one way. So the genocide has already taken place, but if there's another Biafran war, uh, if, if, if the past is any guide, we'll see millions die of starvation and tribal warfare and oil prices will go through the roof because the pipelines will be blown up and it'll just be a mess. Yes. Uh, it, not a pretty situation, especially with the some of the outside instigators. Uh, China has a lot of money floating around in Nigeria right now and uh, you know, Russia's like, hey, can we play too? So, going to be uh, a hard walk in this next year for Nigeria. Well, the the thing with the thing with China is that uh, they're starting to play the old colonialist game, mm -hmm. where they're sending not units of the People's Liberation Army to protect their assets, but in Zimb Zimbabwe, for instance, they've acquired several mines and they send Chinese security companies. Now we used to call these mercenaries, and we have mercenary forces now independent of the nation in which they're living, protecting foreigner assets, in this case Zimbabwe and Chinese-owned mines. Yeah. Uh, Chinese-owned uh, oil manufacturing facilities in uh, Nigeria or South Sudan, if the government falls apart, the Chinese will step in to protect them. They have no problems with that. It's an asset. We're in a different, we're, it's, it's a different world, but it's the old world. And instead of gunboats, it's uh, the equivalent of C-47s or Antonovs flying in and unloading uh, heavily armed uh, men to protect uh, foreign-owned, foreign-flagged assets. George, let's finish out today's program with the Battle of the Archbishops of Canterbury Retired. Uh, Rowan Williams and Archbishop Carey uh, have taken to the news to give their opinion over, uh, what's the best way to call this? Uh, <laughs> advanced adult in, in East Asia. I can't even pronounce it right now. Um, so it's a big topic here in America. We all, uh, we our biggest topic is always abortion. But at the opposite end of life, people say, you know, you're old. You're you're causing strain on the system. We can make this faster for you and more comfortable. And that's the discussion now in, in England, George. Yes, in the in the in the left corner we have George Carey with the red trunks. In the blue corner we have Rowan Williams. And George Carey's got about six inches and about four inch reach over <laughs> Rowan Williams, but Rowan's about 15, 20 years younger. Mm -hmm. So it'll be a close fight. But Rowan's a little scrawny guy. George Carey's a big man. The uh, where George Carey's punching, George Carey uh, penned a letter, penned an article with a rabbi uh, that was appeared in the British Med Medical Journal. Parliament is discussing euthanasia or doctor-assisted suicide laws once again. And the big news is the British 
Medical Association, the BMA, has now relaxed its opposition to it. And George Carey supported, supports euthanasia, uh, voluntary euthanasia, not mm -hmm. involuntary euthanasia, which is oh, called murder. Come on, uh, it's right there. <laughs> and the headline of his article, which is, there's nothing holy about pointless suffering. So you can sort of derive the gist of his article, mm -hmm. and I encourage you to go to Anglican Inc. and read his article in full to, to understand his, his reasoning. But as he says, there's no point for pointless suffering. And those who are incapacitated by pain or whatnot should be allowed the autonomy to choose their own end. And that is, the, the, that is the far, ex uh, I mean, one step beyond that would be you're causing a strain in the system. This is kind of almost there, but not quite there. You know, and do it. It's not good doing it for society. It's doing it because you don't want pointless agony. Rowan says, "We don't know it's pointless, and no, <laughs> we're starting this. It, it, we don't know how God uses you in each of these situations, and this opens the door to uh, euthanizing inconvenient people." Um, the mentally dis this is what the Nazis did uh, for those whose life is not worth living fairly soon the person choosing will not be the person who's dying but rather society or the if great uncle Clarence doesn't pop off I'm not gonna get my hands on his millions so let's help him along or the state doesn't want to care for somebody in an incurable uh, coma we'll just shut it off because it's costing us 10,000 a week um, soon the uh, the experience has always been and it's what we've seen in the Netherlands and in Belgium that uh, euthanasia starts off as voluntary and quickly moves to involuntary and for Rowan Williams there's the two points of the slippery slope and we can't make the claim that point suffering is pointless you know it's never too far from just giving that extra dose of morphine you know, um, I have a friend whose uh, father was in the first week of uh, hospice, very healthy, um, probably really didn't need help, uh, hospice, and the nurse just morphined him. And I don't know how I feel about that. You know, I support hospice, I support end of life care, um, but uh, I. I think that we make it too easy and make it too convenient, certainly here in America. Uh, you were part yeah, of I hospice. Was a, you know. Yeah, I was a hospice chap for six or seven years, mm -hmm. about, about well, six or seven years, a long time ago. And I've never actually, in my experience, met a case where palliative care uh, wouldn't have addressed the issues. Palliative meaning not treating the illness but managing the symptoms Correct. so that someone who has pain, can that pain can be alleviated. Not only physical pain, but psychological and spiritual pain. So a good hospice agency has a holistic approach. Those are the ones that Medicare will pay for. Now the problem, of course, with hospice, and I saw it all the time, and you mentioned it, is that these are institutions. Many of them are for-profit agencies. I left hospice. Uh, essentially because I called my supervisor. They got they moved the chaplain's department from the chief chaplain. When she retired, they moved us under the social worker's department. And the social worker chief had no clue what chaplains did and didn't really care and thought it was all nonsense. And I basically said, well, you're an idiot and a moron. You know, you don't do that to your boss. And then they basically got rid of me and the other uh, salaried chaplains who are making decent wages, not extraordinary wages, and hired us and replaced us all with retirees who are working per diem part time for an hourly rate. So it was called, you know, we're we're having chaplains, which Medicare requires us to have, but we're basically going to get rid of the professional ones and just get old guys who are happy to go out for an hour every every other day. Mm -hmm institutions and this is you know what Rowan Williams argument was institutions bring out the worst of people and 
part of the problem with hospice. People have had wonderful experiences hospice, but not every hospice is the no, dreadful. Yeah, yeah, I'm just giving you one But example. your story, Kevin, does your story doesn't surprise me the least. Yeah. Um, and uh, and not all social workers are bad. A lot of them are, but uh, <laughs> but the uh, we had. Uh, well, I have people in hospice all the time in church. In fact, there are two of my congregations in hospice right now. And one of the things that I know from my time with hospice is that if the family shows up, or if it's at that home, or if I show up at the nursing home every few days, they get excellent care. Mm -hmm. But if your mom is in a hospice in Buffalo and you're in Florida and they're being cared for in a nursing home, yeah, no. it, she's... Yeah. She's not going to be. She's not going to have her needs met, um, whether consciously or unconsciously. People perform when they're being watched better. Yeah, and this so, is this is my friend's experience. Is she wasn't there, and um, the nurse and the doctor communicated, and the nurse said what she thought the patient needed, and the doctor wasn't there to confirm it. My friend wasn't there to confirm it, and. Uh, all of a sudden, the whole family's being gathered in a couple hours because this is it. Uh, when you know, he six months, a year would have been uh, very appropriate for his age and his condition. So, yeah, I mean, I, I called my supervisor, which sort of prompted all this to fall apart. <laughs> I called her a moron and incompetent because we had a uh, a man in his fifty with fifties with Down syndrome. Mm -hmm. who had been cared for at home all his life. His parents had finally died. He was in a nursing home. He, too, was starting to die. His organs were failing, the things that happened to people with Down syndrome. And he had no family. He was a ward of the state. And he was in, in Florida. There are wonderful nursing facilities. And then there are things that are absolutely abominable. You know, the sort of place where there's feces on the floor and you see cockroaches and the smell of urine. It's just dreadful. And, well, you know what I'm talking about, sure. yeah. and it and it was the conversation at a uh, at a uh, at a uh, case review was that well, this guy's life is intolerable. Um, it'd be better if you know. And I said, you can't say that. You can't do that. You know, life is worth living. You never know what God's plans are. And if, and you know, the social worker wasn't prepared to have a theological discussion. Uh, about life and just said, well shut up you work for me and I said no I don't I work for God and well actually God didn't pay me at the time Treasure Coast <laughs> Hospice paid me so uh, but the, the, the point being uh, I personally believe and from my experience there's no need for physician assisted suicide when you have a properly functioning palliative care system All right. and I'm going to tell you guys about uh, Joseph Bisco. Uh, he was a friend of mine for many years. We went to Christ Church Parish back in the 90s. And um, 24 years ago, he had a stroke. And the stroke was very severe. He was in his 40s. And it caused locked-in syndrome. That's where you aren't able to use your, your appendages or your neck or any of your muscles. All he could use was his left eye. He could uh, wink with it. And that's how he would communicate with a little orange board. Uh, you would point to a letter, and uh, he would nod or wink that that's the right letter you're pointing to, and he would spell things out. I, as a young person, thought that was a miserable life. And, you know, the, how can you have any semblance of... Uh, of relationships and education and anything that a human could be. And he lived this way for seven or eight years. And uh, through our time together, the, easily after the third or fourth year, he says, Kevin, I would never go back to the way I was. This way, God has my attention so fully and uh, I'm writing books and I'm, you know, I'm doing all these things. He would just with his eye. <laughs> He's like, you know, and eventually he got a little control of his thumb and he could uh, move with a, uh, a computer controller that way. And his life was more rich just having the function of a thumb and an eye than mine will ever be. You know, and it, he always lived in pain. 
He always lived on with bed sores on a bed. He, his wife died halfway through his uh, illness uh, of leukemia. And it just, to see the, the richness of his uh, spiritual, mental, and, and, and physical life in, in that paralysis just pales in, to anything I see in today's world, George. Yeah, and this takes me back to Kevin to what we joked about at the beginning and what we talked about last week, the tragedy of Jack Spong. Mm. He, he was somebody who did not know Jesus Christ, didn't know Jesus Christ, who his views on uh, physician-assisted suicide were well known. Uh, we should put him out of his misery. Um, it's better for all. It's better for his life to get on, wife to get on with her life. Uh, Spong was on the cutting edge of all these sorts of things. Mm -hmm. But I don't think he knew Christ and the joy that you can have in life even when you're locked in, even when you're paralyzed, even when everything has fallen apart. There's still Jesus and that can set you free. And that's the tragedy, I think, of mm -hmm. someone who had the opportunity to share these truths but instead his pride, his ego, whatever led him astray, led him astray. I'm not saying anything negative about his character. I'm sure he was nice to his dog. Okay, well, no, we're comparing. We're not We're not uh, trying to dissuade or talk about somebody's salvation. We're just, what we have But the, the public utterances, mm -hmm. I think were tragic because here's a man who did not know Christ. Yeah. And it the, the fellow, Joseph, Bisco, I think yeah. was the name you said. Yeah, that's right. He knew Christ, mm -hmm. and he knew that his life had meaning and purpose, and that Christ was alive in him, even when all he had was an eyeball to blink with. And his testimony is partially responsible for Anglican TV. His testimony, what I saw in him, it, what many would consider an empty shell on a bed, uh, was the greatest testimony uh, that a person's able to witness. What you say so, is Kevin, it was pointless agony was not pointless at all. It launched so much. So if he only could move his eye, how could he sign his will, leaving everything to you? <laughs> he did how not, did that happen? He did oh. not. <laughs> <laughs> and, and here, uh, another example, died absolutely penniless. You know, a ward of the state. His wife died. His kids weren't able to take care of him. Um, what you would say, and I would say, and, and modern uh, society would say, burden to the system he was not not in any way I mean, as the not the nazis used to say it's a life not worth living life without life mm -hmm. and they started with the t4 euthanasia program and i think 38 before they even started on the jews and the gypsies and whatnot yeah. this is how it starts yeah, there's somebody else determining life is not worth living mm -hmm. And I hate to say this. No, I don't hate to say this because I say it. I thought the Black Lives Matter movement and this extreme racism that we're seeing in some of our society today, mm -hmm. that the problem with society are white men, that if we just got rid of white men, life would be better. This is, life would be better without them. That, you know, language has consequences and it's yeah. just terrible the world we're moving back into okay George what what have we dosed our audience at 55 minutes we're going to cut it there uh, we will show up again you're available Tuesday I hope yes indeed alright I'm Kevin Coulson and I'm George Conger and you've been watching episode 687 of Anglican Unscripted